the 20th chapter then of John. We're going to talk about the first Sabbath scenes tonight. First Sabbath scenes. It's, it's almost like uh, when you go to the movies and you get to see you know, previews and stuff. You know, some people are just hot for that. They want to see them previews. Can't be late, you know, because even though the movie you've come to see is still a good 20, 30 minutes away while they show you the previews, nevertheless, people like previews. We get scenes out of those movies that they show us. We're going to get some scenes today divided up into three different scenes. We're going to talk about the Magdalene scene. This is Mary Magdalene, obviously. And her resurrection panic. She just panics. We'll get to see how that works out. Secondly, there is a disciple scene as Mary Magdalene comes to the disciples, the 12. Well, actually, it's, we're down to 10 at this point. Uh, Judas Iscariot is dead. Thomas is not there that first resurrection morning uh, and uh, into, that, uh, into that afternoon. And John and Peter are going to go running to the grotto to the burial plot, to Joseph of Arimathea's grave, running to a resurrection. And thirdly, we'll talk about the believing scene, resurrection according to scripture. Let's read the text, John 20, first 10 verses. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran, and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Uh, you can, of course, immediately get the picture that uh, these folks were not really expecting Christ to literally, tangibly, bodily rise from the dead. This was not expected. Even though Jesus, uh, throughout the three and a half years, especially during the last year of his life, repeatedly, again and again and again, told them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of wicked men. He's going to suffer. He's going to be tortured. He's going to be spit, spit upon. He's going to be lashed, and he's going to be crucified. He told them all this stuff, but then he will rise from the dead on the third day. On the third day. And this happens again and again and again. You can really see it in Matthew's gospel in particular. And so what is it, you know, about this? I, I, I maintain uh, the idea, I always have, that these 12, and Judas, of course, is out of the picture of salvation entirely. But these 12, these disciples, you know, they were not regenerate all at the same time. Some of them were not regenerate even up to this time. It still took some time. But by the time you get to the second chapter of Acts and the filling of the Holy Spirit, we know they're regenerate at this point. The Holy Spirit does not indwell that which is undwellable. And so we begin then, 20th chapter. We talk about the Magdalene scene. We focus in on Mary Magdalene. She was of the town of Magdala, not too far from Jerusalem. That's why she's called the Magdalene. That's not her last name. They did not have last names at this time. You know, you hear, you hear in the Bible, or you will read in the Bible, so-and-so son of, so-and-so son of, or uh, if it's a daughter, and then the name of the father is, is given. They did not have last name. So you've heard me say Simon Peter was known as the son of John. He was John's son, and that's where the last name Johnson comes from. Johnson. Um, so there is that. But here, Mary Magdalene, she gets to see the situation along with these other women. We'll talk about them in just a second, how that they were all witnesses to this as well. But let me point out to you, just remember, that nobody really saw Jesus come out of the tomb. 
Nobody saw that. Even the soldiers, the Roman soldiers that were assigned there, when the angels showed up, they just you know, stiffened up like dead men and didn't move. Their fear was so great. But nobody saw Jesus came out of the tomb. But what we get are encounters with the Jesus who was in the tomb. So don't get, don't get funny feelings about your pastor is freaking out or something. Like I'm saying nobody really saw him. Coming. No, I'm just pointing out the facts right here. And it wasn't to everybody. You know, in the book of Acts, it says, chapter 10, Peter says it was only to certain select people. So God is being very selective even in this situation right here. Not everybody gets to see the Magdalene scene, a resurrection panic. First verse, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Uh, we can't get past this, these very first few words right here without offering some significant comment because it is important. Uh, now on the first day of the week. Uh, that, uh, that's an incorrect translation. Always has been an incorrect translation. Uh, the, the Greek is mianton sabaton. You've heard me say that and all, all of you can say that too. Mianton sabaton. Uh, te mianton sabaton is the first of the Sabbaths. The first of the Sabbath. Sabbath is always plural right there. It's pointing towards all the Sabbaths to come. In other words, all of these future Sabbaths are under the direction, under the purview of God, and they are all important. Every Sabbath is important. And of course, we've seen, because we've gone through this already, that this Sabbath that Jesus is raised on is a Sunday on the calendar. It follows the Hebraic mosaic uh, and Genesis of the Sabbath being on Saturday for the Jews. The difference, the major difference between uh, the Mosaic Sabbath and the, uh, the Sabbath of Christ, because it's the day on which he was raised, that's a major difference right there, but the first Sabbath was uh, employed and worked on and sustained by threat of death. We have that in the New Testament, because when somebody is gone through the miracle of regeneration and their, and their uh, sin natures have been removed and their new creations in Christ, they don't need a threat to obey. You want to obey. I'm not saying you won't have some struggles with your flesh, but in your heart, you want that. You want that. And some people move more quickly towards that than others. And that's a different story and a different teaching for another time. But the fact is, is that if you're a new creation in Christ, there will be this. The desire and the willingness to obey. So we don't need a threat. We don't need a threat of death or anything like that. This text says that the day following Friday, which is the preparation day, Saturday, which was the Old Testament legislative Mosaic Sabbath, and then, and then the day following that was Sunday. This is the Miantone Sabbaton, the first of the Sabbaths. Um, I think it's important, so I want you to see it, and you should write this down. There are seven different places in the New Testament, seven different places in the New Testament that speaks about Sunday as Sabbath and how the first century Christians always met on the Sabbath, and it was expected by God. Um, the one passage I'm going to leave out because we've already talked about it is uh, Hebrews 9. Uh, for instance, uh, excuse me, Hebrews the fourth chapter and the ninth verse. I'll just switch everything tonight. Hebrews 4 and verse 9, where it talks about the fact that there remains for the believer a what? Sabbath keeping for the people of God. A sabbatismos. It remains for the people of God. And this is that Sabbath that we're talking about. The first Sabbath that is of the new Sabbath is mentioned back in the 28th chapter of Matthew. Matthew 28 and verse 1. Where Matthew says, now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, after the Sabbath, meaning after the Saturday Sabbath, towards the dawn, as the sun was just beginning to rise, towards the dawn of the Mianton Sabbaton, the first of the Sabbaths, or the Mian Sabbaton right there. First of the Sabbaths. Mary Magdalene came, the other Mary went to see the tomb, and so on. So we've got this going on right here. Mark 6, and by the way, there are very few, very little uh, English translations that translate this as the first of the Sabbaths in all of these passages I'm going to show you. And I'll tell you exactly why that is. It's political. It's political. 
Uh, men don't like the idea. Cr Protestant uh, translators in the main who are conservative for some reason don't like the idea of referring to Sunday as a Sabbath. They want to stay away from that. I think one of the reasons they want to stay away from that is they don't have the transitional teaching of Saturday Sabbath to Sunday Sabbath. I don't think they've got it down. Now, if I'm mistaken about that and you've got it down, please let me know about it. And please explain to me why you would still translate this as, uh, you know, the first day of the week. Uh, there is the, the stipulated idea among uh, Greek grammarians that if you have a singular form of the word uh, a sabbat, Sabbat or Sabaton, uh, um, Omicron Nu at the end, as opposed to Omega Nu, which is a plural form in the genitive case. I say that mostly for those who, who need that over here uh, on YouTube. That if you've got a singular form, it can be translated as meaning the week. And only if the context warrants it. I think Luke 18 gives one context that warrants the use of sabbat, sabbaton, um, as weak. And that's where you've got the two individuals in the temple. You've got the, you got the Pharisee, you've got the tax collector, right? And the Pharisee says, I give, you know, I fast, excuse me, twice in a week. Remember he said that? I fast twice in a week. Well, the word for week there is, is sabbat, it's sabbaton. Uh, that makes sense in the context. He's, he's exclaiming how holy he is and how self-righteous he is in that he, he uh, you know, fasts twice in a week, two times within a seven-day period. Well, isn't that wonderful? Well, that makes sense. But these other phrases do not because of the context and the ongoing use of these terms and this phrase, mian ton sabaton or te mian te sabaton, the first of the Sabbaths. If you look at Mark 16 and verse 2, here's the second place it shows up. Mark 16 and verse 2. I'll give you verse 1 for context. When the Sabbath was passed, we know that's the Saturday Sabbath, yes? Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him too. And very early on the... Mian ton sabaton. You'll see in your Bible, first day of the week. It should be the first of the Sabbaths. By the way, Young's literal translation gets it right. Um, on my, uh, my Bible Works 5, my computer program, um, I've got a series. I could put up a whole lot more, but right now I've got something like 20 different translations I go through every time I, I do a, a word study or something like that or a phrase study. And this is the only one that shows up. You know, in, in English, Young's literal translation gets it right, but he's a little inconsistent about it. But he does get it right in regards to these. So in Matthew 28, 1, it's the first of the Sabbaths. In Mark 16, verse 2, it's the first of the Sabbaths. Mianto and Sabaton. Luke 24, and verse 1, is our third spot. Luke 24, and verse 1, you can see they're all following um, the same resurrection day motif, aren't they? All right, Luke 24, 1 says, but on the first day of the week, uh, again, Young's literal translation here is on the first of the Sabbaths, on the first of the Sabbaths, same Greek, mianton sabaton, at early dawn they went to the tomb, so on and so forth. The fourth place that this shows up is our text, John 20 and verse 1, where the first day of the week, the mianton sabaton, is given right here the first of the many Sabbaths to come is the idea right here. It's also in verse 19 of John 20, by the way. John 20 and verse 19. So the place that this shows up. On the evening of that day, the first of the Sabbaths, Young's literal translation gives it, uh, the first of the Sabbaths, locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, so on and so forth. And then for the sixth place, we go all the way back to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts 20 and verse 7, where Luke writes, as Paul is heading into Troas and going to, to worship uh, on Sunday with the believers, it says 27 now, Acts 20 and verse 7, on the first day of the week, on the Timian ton sabaton, so you know right away what this is saying. First of the Sabbath, when we were gathered together to break bread. 
See, they came together on Sunday, part of their, their first century uh, uh, motif and habit was to come together and share the fellowship meal, which involved the Lord's table, involves the Lord's supper. So he's saying it. We gather together to break bread, and then Paul preaches and so on and so forth. But it specifically states that they gathered together not on a Saturday, not on a Monday, not on a Tuesday. And you can do all that if you want to. And you read in the, at the end of the second chapter of Acts. Am I boring already? No. You're okay? Okay, that's fine. I'm tired too. I'll be, I'll be yawning soon anyway. I probably make these people yawn more than anybody else. Yeah, I'm pointing at you. What was I saying? Oh, great. You were yawning too. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> In this, at the end of the second chapter of Acts, it talks about how they were gathering together on a daily basis uh, at the beginning, sharing their meals together, you know, uh, meeting one another's need and getting the teaching of the apostles, the doctrine of the apostles. But now this is important. Consistently now, we have seen all four Gospels talk about that the first of the Sabbaths to come all took place because of the resurrection of Christ. So the resurrection of Christ should be first and foremost on our minds and on our hearts, which brings about all of our salvation in the first place. Not to mention uh, Romans 4.24, that we uh, have justification through Christ's resurrection. That's where justification comes from. If he wasn't raised, then all of his propitiatory substitutionary work on the cross is for nothing if he was not raised, you see. So this is their habit. This is what is going on. What was that, six that I just gave you? Was that number six? Yep, yeah. yeah, okay. Give you another one, 1 Corinthians 16, the end of 1 Corinthians, last chapter of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16, uh, verses 1 and 2. Here we go. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of the week... Each of you is to put something aside and sort up as may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. What he's talking about here in the context, he's already brought up, brought this up in earlier in 1 Corinthians. He's going to do it again in 2 Corinthians is because of this famine that was going on in and around the arena of Judea. There was a collection being taken from all the various Gentile, mostly, churches uh, to bring financial relief so that there would be food and whatnot coming into the saints that were there under this, under this famine. That's what this collection is all about right here. You're having second thoughts about that right now, aren't you? Yeah, I know. Some people start to yawn, and I look at them after I've said what I've said. <laughs> Sister, I'm with you. I'm tired. I'm tired, too. I know this does not reflect at all on your interest. I, I know that. I'm very well, very well convinced of that. But here, once again, they make this collection when all the saints are together. So think about at the end of our service when we pass the plate. The deacon passes the plate, right? Well, it's the same idea that's going on right here. When did they do it? They did it when they gathered together. What day was that? Meonton Sabaton, or in English, Sunday. They were all gathered together on Sunday. So we learned in Troas, they fellowship, have the Lord's table. Paul preaches to them on Sunday. I'll arrange to try to get Paul to come on Sunday so we have that whole thing locked up. Okay, I thought it was kind of funny. I guess you didn't. Either that or everybody's just too tired right now, all right? All right. And then they have their collection, of course, on Sunday, so on and so forth. Okay, I've done more than what is necessary to prove this uh, in particular. Now I want to share in this 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2 passage, let me share another translation with you. This will be the uh, New Living Translation, which I'm not a fan of. But here, the New Living Translation translates this as instead of saying on the first day of every week, it actually says on every Lord's Day. On every Lord. Now that is a paraphrase because the words kuriakon uh, imira, Lord's Day, are not in the Greek text in 1 Corinthians 16 too. It's mian sabaton. Uh, but here it's every Lord's Day. So they knew what they meant and they translated it as such. Here it's kata mia sabaton. Each first Sabbath is what, what it says. Each, excuse me, each first Sabbath is when they got together and they made this collection. And let me give you one more just for grins. You can grin. Revelation, the first chapter. Revelation 1 and verse 10. Revelation 1 verse 10 says, John says, as he begins to receive this uh, a revelation, that is this book, he begins to give the background of what day it was when he received this revelation. And in Revelation 1.10 it says, I was in the spirit 
on the Lord's day. Exactly like 1 Corinthians 16.2 is translated paraphrastically by the New Living Translation, right? Here, the Greek actually says, Ti Kyriake Emira. Ti Kyriake Emira is, uh, I was uh, in or on the Lord's day. It was the Lord's day, which is the same as Miantone Sabbatone, according to 1 Corinthians 16.2, see? And so there, those are, those are uh, parallel passages or parallel phrases, excuse me. The first of the Sabbaths on the Lord's day, they come together as the same. Okay, I know I spent a lot of time in regards to that, but that's your, that's your full teaching. This is why I say what I say to you. This is why I, I insist to you that t having Bible study in church, on that, that's fine. Have it as much as you want. That is great. But they are not a substitute for Sunday. Not a substitute for Sunday. You see, people say, this is like legalism. No, this is the obedience to the Word of God that you're supposed to want to do if you're a believer. Hello? Or are you, maybe not, maybe you've got a problem, maybe this is something you want to resist. If you're in Christ, you're not going to be able to resist it very long because the Holy Spirit will convict you over this sin. See, the, when, you, when the Bible says to do a thing and you don't do it, it's simple. It's sin. It's to miss the target. So it's not acceptable. And these Protestant churches out there, journey churches or whatever they are out there, having Saturday night services and the elders, who are not being good elders at all, frankly, are, are allowing the people that attend to skip Sunday so they can have Sunday off or go do their thing or whatever it might be in substitution to that. It's still the Lord's Day. It's the Lord's Day all day. And it's to be observed and it's to be recognized as that. And it's to your benefit, see? Hebrews 4, 9, there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. It's for the people of God. It's the day for rest. It is. We rest in Christ's finished work. Fantastic. And there's also a physical application to this rest as well. Of course there is. I think our Puritan brothers and sisters went way too far into the legalist extreme trying to bring the Mosaic standard of several commands over into the church. Okay, they were mistaken about that. Okay, great. Feet of clay. They were human like anybody else. But this is one of those areas. Make sure, by the way, that you don't go to the other extreme like some of our Puritan brothers talked about where you treat the day as if it is, you know, a mosaic standard. Because some of them do that. You know, it's like no cooking whatsoever. And I think, I think we should have that day off. Prepare food in advance and the day before. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, you know, but they were like, you know, to the extreme of, I've been around some of these guys, you know, it's like they won't talk about anything on Sunday unless it has to do with the scripture, has to do with the Lord. I even had one guy say, uh, when asked a question about something has other, other, to, other than to do with uh, the Lord, I think it was a sports question or something like that. The guy likes sports. He said, I, I don't talk about that on the Sabbath. You know, I don't do that. <laughs> well, you're just ridiculous. You, know, you just, just don't understand what the scripture has to say about this. You know, I, let's, let's try to help this person you know, so that they would be free. It is for freedom that you are set free. Don't be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And that's a yoke of bondage. Let's not do that. All right. I'll kick it in the gas now. Back to John, the 20th chapter. So on the first of the Sabbaths, Mary Magdalene, who was one of many ladies, came to the tomb early while it was still, still dark. Okay, so it, well, here's the deal. A lot of people, they try to, uh, in trying to find out or trying to prove to you that the Bible is contradictory, they will look at these uh, these. Uh, gospel narrative passages and they will say, well see, there's contradiction going on right here. You got Mary Magdalene running back by herself in John 20 here to the disciples to tell them. Well over in Matthew, you've got all the women running back to the disciples. But the contexts are entirely different. The women that run back are the same women from Galilee that were there at the cross, right? That were there at the cross and Mary is one of them. And it's very easy to, to put this whole thing together, to synopsisize it as it were. Synopsisize, I think that's a, a made up word. Okay, I'm authorizing it, it's done. Synopsisize is now a word. <laughs> Whatever, Burks, right? Yeah. All right, so you put all this together and you see that what happens is that Mary, 
Mary goes running back first, is what she does. The women stay, if you look at Matthew 28, you parallel that with Mark 16 and Luke uh, 24, you'll find that the women then stay, they look inside, there's two angels that are, that are there. One of them might have been the angel that originally showed up and scared the Bahujis. That's also a word I've made up. The uh, Bahujis out of the, the Roman soldiers that were assigned there to make sure that nothing happened to the body. Remember that whole thing? All right. And they're frozen solid out of fear kind of a thing. The angel shows up. And then eventually they come out of it and they go running back to mama telling you know them what they saw. And they had to be bought off after that and say what they were told told to say, which, uh, which the, the gospels say, this is the story that's reported among the Jews to this day. The, the disciples came and stole the body while we are sleeping. Tell me how stupid that is. Let's put a hat on it and a bow tie and everything, how stupid that is. Go ahead, Frank. And, and their day, if those soldiers were caught sleeping, they were killed. They were done, man. They were toast. That's exactly right. That's exactly correct, what, what Deacon, Deacon Frank just said. And so that's why they had to give the money. And then the, the priest said, and if this comes to the ears of the governor, that's Pilate, we assure you, you know, talk him out of it kind of a, that's what is being implied there, what Frank just pointed out, that they would have been killed. So they had the assurance of, they got the money, that helped them overcome their immediate fear, got the money, and then we got the assurance from the priest that they would have their back, as it were, if this uh, got over to the... Uh, to the, to the priest. But this is precisely, precisely what the, the word that was going on throughout Jerusalem and throughout that area. And it's just the dumbest thing. How many people had to have figured that out in a, in a, you know, a New York minute? But that's just stupid. If they were asleep, then how did they see anybody come if they were asleep? Let alone knowing that it was disciples. Okay, for that. Mary now. Here is Mary. And verse 2 says that she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But check out Matthew 28 with me. Let's look at a comparison here. Matthew 28, and I believe it's the first 10 verses. Yeah. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. And let's look at this now. Okay, so you see what's happening here. Mary has run back. The other ladies are there. They're still there at the tomb. Now Matthew is going to concentrate not on Mary, Magdalene, but on the ladies who are staying at the tomb and what happened with them. 28, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, that would be the Saturday Sabbath, towards the Meonton Sabaton, the first of the Sabbaths, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now, there's several other Marys that are here, and this one is not specified. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. What is funny here is that according to Mark 16, as the ladies were approaching the tomb, they were saying to one, they didn't think about this in advance, who's going to roll that stone away for us? And then Everything begins to shake, you know, and here comes this angel and kicks that stone away. I, you know, and then he sits on it. I love this. Uh, Roll back the stone and sat on it. Verse 3. And they obviously saw it because they're giving testimony here. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. So much for all these people that claim to see angels all the time, right? But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. No doubt in the angel's mind that he was crucified dead, right? Verse 6, he is not here, for he has risen as he said. He has risen as he said. Did anybody here not believe that the resurrection came to pass? Just let me see your hands. You don't believe the resurrection came to pass. Come on, come on. Nobody else is going to know, just us. You don't believe the resurrection actually took place. Come on. Okay. All right. So you're either lying or, or you really do believe that it, it did take place. Look at this right here. It says in verse 6, he has risen as he said. And it came to pass just as he said, didn't it? That means whatever Jesus says, like, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As sure as Christ was raised from the dead, as he said he would be, so he will do that for you, just as he said. 
and all the other promises that are in the scripture and gave us a great testimony out of Psalm 94. He will bring that comfort to pass no matter what your circumstance is. Just as he said. Just as he said. What do you need? What do you need tonight from him? It's as he said and he'll bring it to pass. Come and see the place where he lay. So he demonstrates. The angel demonstrates. Here's where he was. The place is, is empty now. By the way, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, you know, this, this tomb is over there by Gordon's uh, Calvary, the place, of the, the place of the skull right there. And uh, I, I think they've nailed, archaeologists have nailed exactly which tomb this is. It's certainly not that ridiculous thing, you know, that uh, Constantine's mother thought it should be in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. You know, the Church of the Nativity is, is built over it and it's supposed to be this grotto down below there. Ridiculous. Doesn't fit the biblical pattern at all. But that's the power of Roman Catholicism and the threats that they have over people's lives that create some sort of a fleshy faith. It's not true faith, it's fleshy faith. In any case, this, 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 uh, this tomb in particular has this stone. I don't know if it's the original stone or not, but I, I kind of think it is. I mean, they're awfully heavy. They're like tonnage, you know, and it's round, and it's in, a, it's in a kind of a curbed sort of a thing right there. So when you push it all the way back and you lock it down in front, you know, with some sort of a, a shiv of some sort, then you're able to go in, and it's very low, and you can, you can only kind of crouch, you know, and you can't stand up directly. Well, when they would shut that thing, they would, you know, remove that shiv, and it would just roll, the weight of it, roll right back down. Boom! And it was a stop, you know, at the other end. So nobody's getting in. Nobody's getting out, for that matter, either, in the natural sense. But when you get in, normally these things have got layers where bodies would lay and allowed to lay there for a year, according to Jewish tradition. And as the, the flesh, the dead flesh and everything, sloughs off the body... Um, you're, you're left with the bones. Then the, what they would do, after about a year, they would come and they'd take the bones and they'd place, place it in a it's, a, it's a, it's a box. It's called an ossuary. Yeah, Elder Tony knows about this. An ossuary, see? And that's, that's where the final resting place uh, would be. And it would go with, with family members into a family crypt and, and normally that was, that was the case that was practiced right here. Well, when he's saying, come in here, see, take a look, he's not here. The angel is showing her these uh, ledges, you know, uh, of various heights, and there's no body in there. Remember it was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb? It was for Joseph and his family. There's nobody in there, including the Lord Jesus. And he goes on to say, verse 7, now he's talking to the women, right? Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now, uh, well, that's coming up in just a second. All right, go quickly, right? Well, Mary is already gone. According to John 20, Mary's gone. She's, she's already run back. Now the women see the angels and they go quickly. Tell them what we've, what we've showed you and what we've told you. Verse 8, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear but great joy. I mean, it's got to be both. It's like this is incredibly scary, but he's alive. He's not dead. This is where the great fear kicks in, the great joy, excuse me. And ran to tell the disciples, verse 9, and behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings, shalom, peace be unto you. And they came up and took hold of his feet. That means they're on their knees in worship. Oh, and worshiped him. Verse 10, then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So that's important right there. So you can see there's no real contradiction working right here. It does not, a contradiction is, contradicts what is said. It's something of the opposite of what was said. So do you see anything in here that says Mary Magdalene was with them? So it's not contradicting it. John 20 says Mary took off and the other women stayed. Does it say in Matthew 28 that Mary Magdalene was with the women as they talked to the angel and they looked inside the door? No, and it doesn't need to because John 20 says that Mary Magdalene took off first. So I want you to see that for context. You can also see it in Mark 16, but I'll, just for time's sake, I'll let you look on, that, look on that yourself. Now back to John 20, verse 2. So she ran, Mary did, and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Now I want to take a minute with this because this is important. Yes, I am going to go all the way to the 10th verse. Don't <laughs> so she runs to tell Peter, and it doesn't say John. It doesn't give Nathaniel's name. It doesn't, none of the guys. 
Not Simon, guys. Uh, not James, but the one whom Jesus loved. Now, we're getting more of that term uh, that's taking place right here. So here's what I want to tell you about this. Uh, traditionally, and we have to say tradition, we've got a couple of church fathers that point out that the one whom Jesus loved was, in fact, John. But more important than that, I think the scriptures point this out. Now, why is this important? Okay, Because there is a whole group of people right now, and every now and then you see a book come out, and historically there are books uh, written in regards to this, that the other disciple was not, in fact, John the disciple, the brother of James, one of the sons of thunder, Okay, uh, and that somebody else wrote this gospel. First of all, I don't see any point in this argument whatsoever. Now, here, here, here's where they get their gas from, okay? Uh, the oldest manuscripts that we have in regards to the Gospel of John do not title it Kata Yohani, according to John. There is no title. It just starts out, you know, that which was in the beginning and so on. Uh, it, so there's no, but traditionally we've got this rolling along right here. Secondly, if you compare the grammar, even in English, between John's gospel, the three epistles and the book of Revelation, especially John's gospel and the three epistles, you can see it's the same person that's writing this. It's the same, same kind of phraseology, same tone, same expression. It's the same guy who's writing all this stuff. Now, why is this important? Why, why is this important? Okay, if it's not written by John, if this one whom Jesus loved, this beloved disciple, is not in fact John, then we've got a problem here. We've got a problem in regards uh, to inspiration, the doctrine of inspiration. That means that this, this term, if it's not refer the one whom Jesus loved, if it's not referring to John, see, uh, then who is it referring to? Because the fact of the matter is that the Bible does say, does say, I'm going to show it to you right now, that the one whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is in fact John, the apostle, the, the brother of James, son of Zebedee. Now, this phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one whom Jesus loved, this is a phrase that John uses throughout the gospel. We've seen it once already. This is a paraphrasis. A paraphrasis, not two phrases. Just let that work for a second. Okay, it's not going to get any more funny. All right, that's it. All right, paraphrasis, paraphrasis. Something other than his normal name, John. This is how he speaks of himself. For instance, if you look back at 1323, John 13 and verse 23, you're going to see the beginning of this. 1323 says, one of his disciples, and then it says, whom Jesus loved. That's paraphrasis. And you can imagine John writing this, not using his name, but using this phrase. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of humility is what it is. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loves, was reclining at table. So they're at, the, they're at the final Passover just before he's arrested that night. Specifically the one whom Jesus loved. The other gospel accounts talk about how he was the one that was leaning his head. The one whom Jesus loved against Christ's chest and this sort of a thing. All right, now, now slip on back to chapter 20. Let these build up, okay? 21, chapter 21 and verse 2. Chapter 21 and verse 2. And this is after... Uh, the ten minus Thomas have already encountered the raised Christ and then Thomas eight days later encou encounters him along with the other disciples. Now some time has gone by. Now we know that it's 40 days from the resurrection to his ascension because the first chapter of Acts says that. So this is happening, chapter 21 is happening somewhere within that 40 day period. Chapter 21, verse 1, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. Tiberias is Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Now watch this. I want you to count, I want you to count the number of disciples who are here with Simon Peter. First it's Peter, Simon Peter, that's number one. Then Thomas, number two, called the twin, Didymus. Number three, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. So that's three, right? Then the sons of Zebedee. Who are the sons of Zebedee? James and John. Excellent. James and John. So that's four and five, right? Then it says at the end, and two other of his disciples were together. These guys are unnamed. Now are these two of the twelve apostle disciples? Because there were other disciples, you have to understand, that were not of the twelve. Or were they outside of the, the twelve? Well, the text doesn't say it. It doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter. But what you've got here is you've got seven individuals here, including one of them is John, one of the sons of Zebedee. Everybody agree with this? Everybody agree with me that in chapter 13, verse 23, it talks about the fact that, that one of them that was there at the Passover, the one whom Jesus loved, was there at the Passover table. Do you agree with me that, uh, well, I'd have to show it to you. It would take some time. I don't have time. Uh, all of the gospel accounts, especially Luke, speaks of the fact that at the Passover, at the Last Supper, there were 12 of them. The 12 sat down with Jesus. It doesn't say anybody else sat down with him, but the 12. So we're affirming what the text says, not what it doesn't say. One of the 12 that, that was there at the table at the Last Supper was one whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Everybody agree with that? Okay, very good. I haven't said anything that I haven't already showed you, you know, already, except for the, those brief things about, you know, uh, um, the 12 there and all the Gospels. Uh, you can look that up yourself. So here now, during this 40-day period, come on, work with me. For, don't go to sleep on me or anything like that. This is, this is God's Word. This is eternal. Let's work with it, okay? We got seven guys right here who are about to go fishing together, essentially, and are going to be failures at it. One of them is John, the son of Zebedee. Now go down to verse 7, same chapter, chapter 21, verse 7. This is after the Lord has told them to cast the net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some fish, so on and so forth. Verse 7 says, that disciple, note this, whom Jesus loved, whom Jesus loved, Therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And of course, Peter throws his clothes on, jumps into the water. Verse 22. Verse 22. And this is where Peter turns and sees the, the verse 20. The disciple whom Jesus loved following them, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved is one of the seven. Same context. One of the seven who was also at the Lord's last supper, who leaned his head against his chest, and was called the one whom Jesus loved. Yes? Peter says in verse 21, chapter 21, verse 21, when Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Which man? The one whom Jesus loved. Now watch this. Here we go. Jesus said to him, verse 22, if it is my will that he remain until I come, bracket that or something, underline it or something. If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. We know for a fact, a historical fact, that John the disciple was one of the very last, if not the last, of the twelve to remain alive up until the parousia. Some of the twelve were alive after the three and a half years started taking place, but a lot of them were being killed off before that and during that period. We know that John passed through that because we've got the writings of church fathers that speak about that, that he was alive after that and took testimony. People who knew him or either knew um, uh, of those who were John's disciples later, and they gave testimony to this. Jesus says, if he remains until I come, what is that to you? He remains until I come. History says that John the disciple, the son of Zebedee, was there living pa during and past the parousia of A.D. 70, the second coming of A.D. 70. He saw that. He remained until the Lord came. What is the name of the individual who remained until the Lord came? Verse 20. The disciple whom Jesus loved, right? Which is the same phrase that we've been seeing throughout this. Therefore, if history corroborates, because we wouldn't have the book of Revelation without it, history corroborates that it was John that lived through to this, up to this, and past this. And it says that Jesus' will was for him to remain until he came, and that the he who came was the one that would remain, was the one whom Jesus loved. Therefore, therefore, who is the one whom Jesus loved? It's John. There's no way around this. Therefore, who wrote this book? John, bingo, bango, see? But you got to work it. you got to be willing to work it. This is one of those things. I mean, I had a, I had a preterist pastor maybe, I don't know, years ago now, I think, I think it was. And he just took me to task. He, see, he yelled on to this point of view that it was not John who wrote, you know, the Gospel of John. I'm trying to show him some, oh, kind of a thing, you know. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I mean... People get a hold of an idea, and it works for them 
for whatever reason, sometimes they like the attention it, it brings them. They like the, uh, the the fact that this is this is very uh, what's the what's the, what's the word? Talk about tired. Uh, so what? Novel. Well, yeah, it's, it's well, but it's historical. It's been around for a while. People talk about it a lot, you know, that whole kind of a thing. It gets people's attention, you know, and it's like that means they're going to get attention, right? It's no good, ladies and gentlemen. So, again, here's the kind of thing you need to be able to take the unbeliever through. So it's an unbelieving position to say that John is not the disciple whom Jesus loved. After I just showed you what I did, if you don't believe that John is the one who Jesus loved, it's unbelieving. I didn't say you weren't saved. I'm saying you don't believe what Scripture says. You're an unbeliever, at least in regards to this. Shocking, isn't it? I better move here. The other, I'm back in chapter 20. The other disciple, verse 2, whom Jesus loved, said to them, this is Mary Magdalene talking now, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Who's the they? I don't, I don't know what she's talking about right here. I guess she figures it was maybe the Jews or something like that that took away his body to sort of do something. I don't know. She's, she's panicking. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. The we probably would have been the, the other women you know, that, that were there to see the fact that the tomb was, in fact, empty. This is the resurrection panic. So the first point takes 45 minutes for your pastor to do, if not better than that, which brings us to the second point, the disciple scene. Now, this is going to go kind of fast, so here we go. Running to a resurrection. So what is Peter's response? What is John's response? Well, they're not going to believe Mary because in that, those days, a woman's testimony wasn't, you know, didn't mean much anything at all. And so, verse 3, Peter went out with the other disciple. Who's the other disciple? John. John. And he's the one who? Jesus. Jesus loved. And they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter, or as the NASB says, uh, ran first. He, he ran first, or ran faster, excuse me. Uh, I don't know what the deal with that is. Maybe Peter was overweight. I don't know. Peter had reached and did outrun Peter, and he reached the tomb first. Verse 5. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but did not go in. Hmm. Now, here's something fascinating. Maybe you remember this. I pointed this out to you once before. What we've got here is we've got a Greek word, kegmena. We've got kegmena going on here for claws. It's a present uh, participle. That means that what we have here lying here is not so much that which is strewn about, but it's sort of like a cocoon. It's like a cocoon is what this word talks about. It's like a, a, the chrysalis of a butterfly, right? So what, what he saw as he looked in there, remember how that how the Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took the body and they began to wrap it and they tucked the, the spices and the resin, the gummy resin, in between the strips of cloth, right? And it, it hardened is what it did after, after almost three days. And so when he was raised, you would think that this thing would be, I mean, how would you get out of that? You know, you'd rip it off or something like that, right? Not Jesus. Because when he was raised, he was raised in a glorified state. That's the, the word theologians give it. And until somebody comes up with a better phrase, I don't know what else to talk to call Jesus' body, his resurrection body, other than that, it was in a glorified state. Because when he shows up to see the boys that night of his resurrection, he just appears in the room. whole place is locked up, and the biblical writer here goes to great pains to point out the fact that the doors were locked, the windows were shut. The idea was nobody was getting in, and Jesus just appears, says, Shalom. Got anything to eat? Proves that it's him. Then he disappears again. Same thing happens with the, uh, the 500 who saw him all at once. You know, what's going on right here? He's in a glorified state. So what's happening here is when they looked in here and they saw the claws not lying there, but cocooned there. Cocooned there. It says, but he did not go in. Kind of scary if you stop to think about it. This is all first time stuff. This has never happened before and has never happened since. This is the only time in the history of the earth that somebody has been res resurrected like Jesus was resurrected. By the way, if you're going to take the position that you're going to be resurrected like Jesus is, was resurrected, I want to know where I can see your cocoon after the fact. So he did not go in. Kind of scary. Verse 6, then Simon Peter came following him. That's John, right? Following John. And went into the tomb. 
Peter's not like John. He's he perpetuous and he just goes right in. Peter comes, following him, went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying. Same word is in the bottom of verse 5. Verse 5, he saw the linen cloths cocooned there. Now bottom of 6, he, Peter, saw the linen cloths cocooned there. It gets better. Verse 7, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen claws. Now the word there for lying has the idea of standing. Standing. Not standing where the linen claws were, but folded up or rolled would be better. New American Standard says rolled. Rolled there in a place by itself. So what you've got here is you have the face wrapping, which is uh, the head wrapping, which is separate from the rest of the body. So that, that which was wrapped around his body was in a cocoon shape. <laughs> no wonder John wouldn't go in, you know. It was in a cocoon type shape, which just says, well, how the heck did he get out of that? Well, clearly, God dematerialized him. Not Star Trek. God dematerialized him and then rematerialized him. And that's how he got out. You think that the angel needed to roll away the stone for Jesus to get out of the tomb? No. The rolling away of the stone was so we could look in. It was evidence for us. It's not to get Jesus out. He was already out. Gone. And the head, the head wrapping was rolled up. Jesus took it off, you know, and rolled it up and placed it apart from this cocoon. That means whoever got out of the cocoon was able to talk about a moment of absolute cool. <laughs> he dematerializes. He's outside of the cocoon now, takes this thing off his head, rolls it up, sets it off to the side. But Jesus always made his bed when he was growing up. Puts it off to the side by itself. Verse 8, which brings us to the third point. So we saw the disciples scene. They were running to a resurrection. Now thirdly, the believing scene, the resurrection according to Scripture. Then the other disciple, verse 8, who reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and believed. Well, that's John. That's the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Notice that he sees and believes. He doesn't go away like Peter seems to, scratching his head, wondering what the heck. But John was there throughout the entire matter, wasn't he? He was there in the garden. He ran, but he made sure he followed Christ. See, he was a follower of Christ, even when Christ looked like this is over with. He followed him anyway. He, John didn't care what it looked like. He's arrested. He's over with. His ministry is done. John didn't care what, what it looked like because for John, all he cared about was what Christ said. And Christ said that he would be tormented, tortured, spit upon, whipped, crucified, and would be raised the third day. I thoroughly believe John was expecting this. And he went in and believed. Believed what? He believed that he was raised. Why? Because this is the coup de grace. Of everything that Jesus said about his being raised, he would be raised, as a matter of fact. Now, the text says here, he saw and believed. Verse 9 is the most important part. See, I told you we'd be okay. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. See, there it is. The scripture. Now, when it says scripture here, it means the accumulation of scriptures into one theme of scripture, which is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back uh, to their homes. Now, now let's do this rapidly. You can either follow me or you can just write it down. Psalm 16 and verse 10. This is what the author is talking about here. Psalm 16 and verse 10, which is repeated several times in the New Testament as testimony for the resurrection of Christ. See, they don't point. Now, remember, think about this for a second. None of the disciples in their preaching pointed to an empty tomb. They didn't talk about the rock rolled away. They didn't talk about the angel showing up. They didn't do any of that stuff. What did they do? See, the natural man goes for that which is super, supernatural. He goes for the thunder and the lightning. But God says, go to my word. And so the proof that they offer is not some 4th of July fireworks exhibition. The proof that they offer is the scriptures. Hath God not said. Chapter 16 and verse 10. 
after he goes through all of this, he says, and this is Messianic, you, you, we've been here before, for you, Messiah speaking to the Father, will not abandon my soul to Sheol, to hell, or let your Holy One see corruption. Where the body corrupts. The body, see, in, in, in the New Testament when this is used, see, when they quote it, is to experience this thing, to know this thing, to have an experience with this. This is see, orao in Greek, to see a thing, to experience a thing. You will not let your Holy One see, experience, know corruption. The body did not corrupt. Now I got reform guys saying to me that that doesn't mean, I can't believe that they think this way. I must be talking to a Democrat or something. That, that when, they, when they see this text and it says that, he, that the Lord would not see or experience corruption, it points to the fact that he would be raised. My friend, the text doesn't say that. The text says that the, the body of Christ would not experience corruption. It would not cor experience ruination. You see? And that's what it means. I, wanna, I, I remember when Sam Frost and I were entangled about this. I couldn't believe he was pressing this. Maybe he still believes it. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. I don't want to put words in his mouth. But we went round and round in regards to this. See, so the scriptures, Psalm 16, verse 10, his holy one would not see corruption. How about the, the book of Jonah? For the book of Jonah, I want you to go to Matthew. Matthew 12. Yeah. Book of Jonah, we go to Matthew 12 for the resurrection. Watch this. This is fabulous. Verse 39 and 40. Matthew 12, verse 39 and 40. Well, we'll better do 38. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. Think God likes signs? Uh, prove it to me, God. Can you, you know, pick up a stone that's too heavy for you to pick up? stupid. But he answered and said an evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet who? Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish so will the son of man be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. They didn't understand this scripture. Jesus had already talked it to him. This is midway through the ministry, the three and a half year ministry of Christ. This Matthew 12 passage. Were they not listening? They were sleeping. <laughs> In one way or the other. How about Acts 2, verse 24 through 31? Acts 2, verse 24 through 31. See, I'm taking you to these New Testament passages to emphasize, to emphasize the Old Testament testimony that John says for they did not understand the scripture that pointed toward Jesus' resurrection. What better place to do than to have the Holy Spirit through the apostles tell us what these Old Testament passages mean. Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, verse 31. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection. I better go back to 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. What does that mean? That means go open it up and you'll see that his body is still there. Being therefore a prophet, David was a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, 31, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. Guess what passage in the Old Testament he is, he's talking about, he's commenting on right here. Go back up to verse 27. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Oh, Psalm 16, verse 10. That's a pretty heavy-duty passage for this. He foresaw, verse 31, and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see, experience corruption. This Jesus whom God raised up, and so on and so forth. Paul does it one more time now in chapter 13, starting at verse 35. Acts 13 and verse 35, Paul preaches it too. Acts 13, 35, therefore he says also in another song, Psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. That's the third time we've seen this come up. For David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. By the way, what's the purpose of God in your generation? 
What's the purpose of God? Every day we need to rise up and we need to ask the Lord, what is your purpose for me today? Well, the way you start off that day is by opening up his word. That's where you find out what his purpose is. And let the word of God drill God's purpose into your heart and drive you in the direction that the word says. David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep, died, and was laid with his fathers and saw, experienced corruption. So he's not talking about David. Psalm 1610 is not talking about David, is it? 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything. Remember we were talking about uh, uh, the Old Testament Sabbath before, right? And, and the demands that the Mosaic system made upon people for that. Everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. The first Sabbath scenes. We get Mary Magdalene. Poor Mary. She's in such a panic. She's running back to the disciples. Who knows what the heck she's thinking. All she knew is when she reported to the boys, you know, they have taken away the body. and We don't know what they've done with it. So Peter and John, second point then, they, of course, have a scene of their own, the disciple scene. They are running to the resurrection now. They get there, and they... He's lagging behind. John gets there first. He doesn't go in because he sees that the linen wrappings, that if the body was gone, should have been removed. Look, if somebody stole the body... Would you like take time to remove the wrappings? No, you just want to get the body out of there. So one guy gets on one end, the other guy gets on the other end, and we haul out. We get out of there, right? But this is completely different. This is a resurrection. He demon his body was dematerialized. If not, explain to me how the body got out of this wrapping. What, through the head hole? What? Because <laughs> that's the only hole that was available. And so they see this cocoon wrapping, this evidence. I'm so glad that thing never got saved because people being stupid would just worship it, wouldn't they? And that's what they saw, the cocoon running to this resurrection. That's what they saw. What do you see? Finally, the believing scene, resurrection according to Scripture. God does not bring us into the fireworks exhibition that the unregenerate man will do. In order to prove their point, they got to have Mohammed doing a night flight or something like that. They got to have some, you know, some, something that expresses the, that this God that they believe in is greater than all the other gods in the world. And so my God, you know, can do X, Y, and Z, all this tough stuff, right? But who could do this? None of them were raised. Tell me about a religion, another religion in the world, where its, its main purpose, their God, is raised in some way. It doesn't exist because nobody could do it. Nobody could do it. Jesus does the impossible because his father, John chapter 10, told him to do it, gave him the authority to do it. And so the Trinity is at work in the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ proves the Trinity, by the way. You'll need to think about that. And then we have the scriptures pointed out to us. These guys, they didn't understand the scripture yet that he must rise from the dead. But by the time the Holy Spirit comes and indwells them, fills them, comes upon them, empowers them, there it is. Then here comes the scriptures. Remember the two that were on the road to Emmaus? Remember the testimony of these two guys was, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened up what? the scriptures to us. See, that's what matters. Does your heart burn? Man, mine does. Does your heart burn when you're into the word? If not, ask God to make it so. Ask God to change your attitude. That's all. Ask God to, to come and leave nothing left in this husk of a life that we have. Let there be nothing left except the burning inside of my heart for the scriptures and for God's communication. This is what should be evoked in the first of the Sabbath scenes. So, Lord, tonight, thank you, Lord, for teaching us your word. And, Lord, we believe that you will hide it within our hearts, O oh God, and that you will raise it up out of us so that we might be the light that you are to a lost and dark world out there. Lord, let us take hold of every opportunity. 
to bring the truth of the resurrection to people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you heard our prayers tonight, O oh God, and that we look forward now to you bringing to pass the needs, Lord, uh, of all the people we prayed for. We believe and thank you uh, for Jim's new job. We thank you for the work that you've been doing in other people's lives, Lord. We know that this is you doing it, and you call us, Lord, to be a part of the intercession that brings these things to pass by faith alone in Christ alone. Thanks, Lord. Take your people now, Lord, not only those who are watching on YouTube, but those who are here tonight at study. Lord, truly bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them and be gracious unto them. Lift up your countenance upon them this day. Give them peace tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody said, Amen. Let it be so. You're dismissed.